refer back to the, in the earlier introduction about the, the first iteration of this talk. Of course, jumped at the chance to come and debate uh, oil and ethics with uh, people on the right, I assume. Um, but uh, I said that I'd pick on the, the first guy that was supposed to come and debate me first, so I will. Uh, Tom Flanagan. Tom Flanagan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, what a response. <laughs> It's actually the second time that people have backed out of debates with me, and we, we're not sure whether it's because he, you know, he couldn't found the thought of coming to debate this issue in this environment with me or anyone else, but we did check his course schedule. <laughs> his excuse for backing out was that he had a class today, but he is not teaching this semester. <laughs> On this day, anyway, so uh, there you go. All right, so you know, take take that and uh, make your own conclusions about uh, how willing the right is to get up and defend their ideas in a in a free space where they're not controlling every minute of the debate and the terms of the parameters and so forth, and where they have to face up to people with real ideas and commitments like yourself and like myself. Um, I'm going to try to keep it. Uh, at, I can't say as exciting as a debate because uh, I was I was pretty excited to come and do the debate. I know you probably would love to see. Uh, people debating these issues here. So if there is anybody from the right, you know, some some young Jedi of the right who wants to take Darth Flanagan's place afterwards, uh, uh, feel free. Maybe we have some time to do that and we can step up and, and have a little fun doing that. But in that, in, if it's not the case, so uh, I'm going to talk about, um, as my host said, um, the work that I'm doing right now. And it's it's different work than the work that I spent most of my career doing. And I think I talked about this last time a little bit towards the end of my talk when I, when I was here, about how over time I've come to realize the different dimension of colonization. And I think collectively we're all coming to realize too that colonization is not a problem that can be resolved in the ways that we've been trying to resolve them. You can, we, I think what we found collectively in moving through the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s in trying to address this issue of colonizing this issue, this massive problem of fundamental injustice of colonization of our territories and its effect on our peoples, is that the, the way that we've been addressing it through law and politics and economics is not getting at the fundamental problem as it manifests in our life. And, and what I'm saying there is that politics and economics and law can only do so much. Yeah. That the root of the problem is really a political, legal, and economic uh, effect of dispossession of people from the land. So our separation from the land, my argument would go, and more and more people are starting to realize it and argue this way, is the fundamental injustice. And that unless we pursue it to the point where colonial, where we understand the problem as colonialism manifested <laughs> as a degradation of our relationship, or a removal, or a separation, or, or um, a, a cutting off, really, of our lifeline, being our connection to our land and our presence on our land, we're not really going to get anywhere. And I think people who work at the AFN, people who work at NAHO, people who work in communities at, uh, at the real grassroots level understand these problems as they manifest. And when they look at all the kind of efforts that have been put forth, good faith efforts, people using their best intelligence and their good mind and their good heart coming at it, and they see how it's just spinning wheels and that people continue to get ground into uh, ground into, the, into the, the dirt, really, in terms of their lives and the feelings that they have about living their lives. It's not really getting us anywhere, the models that we're putting into place now. So what do we do? What I've done is try to think through it as a member of the uh, intelligentsia. That's really all I can do. I mean, I'm not a I'm not, uh, national chief of the AFN. I'm not chief of a big tribal council or a chief of a band or anything like that, where if I have this understanding, I can try to marshal resources and put it into place on, on the ground in the community. I wish there were people in those positions that would do that, but in, in the work that we do collectively here as people who are intellectual, students, writers, artists, uh, some of us are activists as well, but mostly what we do is try to impact in the way people think about these things. Okay, we try to think about the way people understand problem, how they frame the problem, and then how they think about what they're going to do about that problem. And for me, uh, in the work that I do, uh, it's mainly based in the context of trying to influence Native people's perception of themselves and what the focus of their life should be. What's the purpose of their life? Okay. And when they come to me as a professor, and when I go into community environments and talk like this, most people are coming because they want some sort of vision that can help them understand 
what it is that is dragging their people down and keeping their people down. And that the visions that they're offered are so unsatisfying. And I can say it's not as an intellectual, but as a community member myself too. I mean, I grew up on a reserve. Uh, I grew up in the wake of environmental devastation and colonization. And uh, just like a lot of people here. And then uh, I'm an urban Aboriginal now, I guess, uh, in Canada, as it's called. I live in the city. I have lived in the city and I've traveled all over the place. And I feel just like, I'd say, I, I think it's fair to say, most Native people, that the, the, the visions that are put forward are just not, not satisfying. They're not motivating. I think if they were motivating, we'd see Natives in the street. We'd see people doing things. We'd see people getting behind those visions. Um, the ones that are offered uh, in the mainstream organizations that uh, purport to represent us are not motivating at all in that respect. What are the ones that are motivating? The ones that are motivating are those people who are taking action to reconnect their people and the children that they have to the cultures and to the existence that their ancestors had on the land. That's really motivating. People get up and fight for that. People sacrifice for that. And people begin to move for that. And that's what we're finding today, too. And so the insight on that particular point is really crucial because it shows that there is something that's making the connection to the hearts and the minds of the indigenous people in this country who are the ones who are bearing the burden of colonization. There's a lot of people who sympathize with the, with the struggle of indigenous people. But to be honest, you know, the people that have to bear, to bear that burden are the indigenous people. And the ones that have to take the lead in conceptualizing what to do about it are the indigenous people. And then people will come on board or not, depending on whether or not it resonates with them, right? And so, uh, as an indigenous intellectual, uh, for all of us, I think that's our responsibility, is to give an authentic vision, something that really resonates with Native people, and not in terms of just their mind, and being able to think through theoretically colonization. I think we've done a really good job of that. You know, I, I uh, jokingly say I'm not writing any more political <coughs> books. I said everything in my three books that I wrote. People have read, I think, really only two of them. Because a lot of people, uh, my first book, it, haven't read it because it's about Kanawha and specific and so forth, plus it's on print. Um, but the, the, the second and the third one, people have read. And uh, I, get e I get emails and contact all the time. People say, you know, what do I have to say about politics? What do you think about those books? And, and things like that. And honestly speaking, right now, I can't think of anything new to say in terms of a critique of the political environment that we live in uh, as First Nations people. I mean, I can say it over and over in different ways and hopefully entertaining and engaging ways. But um, fundamentally, uh, I think we understand that First Nations politics is corrupt. Uh, and inherently so, even if you come into it as a good person with good intentions, the whole structure of politics is corruption, because what it is is meant to maintain a colonial reality. I think we understand that. I think we understand that economic development is not really oriented towards the, the alleviation of the symptoms of colonization on Native people, that it's really for the benefit of corporations and uh, uh, a small segment of the Canadian population who, who profits from it. Uh, we understand that. Uh, we understand a lot of things uh, about the political environment that we live in. And so to say more about that as an intellectual is kind of like uh, not wasting your time, but I think that we have a, a higher responsibility to challenge ourselves to think about these things in a deeper way. And that means going outside of our comfort zone as people who work in this environment. Because as the colonial structure and everything that makes it up, uh, politics, law, education to a certain extent, the, the kind of education programs that are funded and validated in universities that we all work in are part of that colonial complex and we're rewarded for following that pathway. Um, we're rewarded for banging our heads against the wall and for wringing our hands with anxiety about how things are not working and we're not really getting anywhere because we get jobs, the funding is there. Well, it's, it's a lot less now after the last month or so, but uh, there is funding there compared to these other pathways that we can refer to. And so the challenge for indigenous intellectuals is to really step outside of that and say, okay, I know, I know that there's a risk. There's a kind of a career risk. There's, a, uh, there's, a finan there's not the financial reward. There's not the compensation that comes with it. There's the extra hard work of having to organize in a, in a way that is not already organized. You know, you're not working in an environment that is well set and structured and where you can step in and have effect and so forth. Uh, you're really working at the, at the ground level like a lot of people for a long time. Um, and as intellectuals, what, a big point that I'm making these days when I go talk in academic forums and so forth is that it is a responsibility to move over and begin to 
uh, elaborate this. Theoretically, we get to elaborate it in terms of its rationalization and to really get people thinking about this as the really only way to solve the problem. That if we move from uh, a situation in, 19, in the 1980s, when I first came into this business and then worked here in the 90s, where self-government and uh, institutional solutions were, were the thing, and where everybody dedicated all their time and energy to it, to a point now where people see that as a marginal solution or a kind of a, a thing that needs to be done pragmatically to keep uh, some things going, but that our, our energies, and when we teach our, pe uh, our young kids about what they're gonna be doing when they're older, should be directed in another way towards trying to restore culture on the land and then the more fundamental point of restoring our land base to our control and presencing our people again on our land base, that's the thing we should be doing, then I think we'll have made progress. So we've made some progress, of course. I'm not meaning to dismiss everything. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned I've been working in this since the 1980s and uh, I've seen definite progress in terms of the, the way that our people understand colonization. You know, when we come into it, we didn't really understand it because as a subject of colonization, almost inherently, you're confused about who you are and the situation that you're facing. There are some people, of course, that have maintained a sense of themselves throughout this whole process. People who remain connected to the land. People who remain rooted in the cultural understanding and an understanding of themselves based on their language and their ceremony and so forth. There's always been people like that. But for the most part, uh, Native people like myself coming into it were confused about what we were doing. You know, we knew there was a problem. We knew we were we were fighting against something. We didn't like the fact that our communities were, were the way they were. But uh, the focus of the energy was misdirected, I would say, in hindsight. It was directed at um, the target which was put in front of us by the colonizer. So, all right, the Indian Act is the problem. Here you go, you know, self-government. Get at that Indian Act. And in the end, what do you get? You get another kind of Indian Act that, you know, you've created for yourself. And then, if, uh, if strictly speaking, uh, standard of liberty and poverty material standards and material conditions of life are the problem. Well, well here you go. Um, poverty is the problem. Address that. Get a job. Um, get an education. Get, get some income. And what are you then? You're just, you're, you're another citizen. Uh, a taxpayer and citizen. Uh, could go down the line and I do this sometimes uh, in my other talks. But today, I want to kind of take it beyond that to kind of talk about the positive uh, statement of what's the alternative. Um, to, to start off, though, I think we have to kind of be clear about um, what the manifestation of colonial racism is in Canada today. Uh, it has been understood, colonial, the colonial racism has been understood as, generally speaking, uh, the dispossession of our people. Okay, so the occupation, the use and occupation, the denial of legal ownership, and the, uh, the creation of a whole new legal regime of ownership and the use and benefit of that land by people who came afterwards and who didn't go through proper uh, procedures of, of uh, transfer of that ownership to the new people. And so, you know, that's kind of the framework that people operate in when they understand what colonialism is in terms of this possession. And that's all, that's been happening, of course. <laughs> uh, and that is still happening. Okay, that's, but that's only one way that Native people are disconnected from their land. And if we think about it only as this possession, uh, we're only seeing uh, a small part of the story. Okay, this possession, we also have development. Okay, you could be possessed of your territory, but be subject to the kind of development, industrial, and otherwise it goes on in territory, and feel the same kind of loss as if that land was alienated from your land base. Take, for example, my own home community, Ganawage. Okay, Ganawage, uh, we've been there for a long time. We're still there, but I think that one of our, if one of our ancestors from uh, 300 years ago, or even 200 years ago, walked into Gunawake today, they'd hardly recognize the place. Yeah, I don't even know if they'd want to live there. Because you look at anybody who's been to Gunawake, um, development has changed that landscape and changed that society to such a point where it's fairly, it's fairly recognizable from what it was. Um, the bridges, the tell telephone lines, the electricity lines, the cables that go under the river, the fiber optic cables, highways, and all these kind of things. So development 
happens and changes the character of the land and is just as important in dispossessing people from that land as anything else. So it's not simply a matter of legal possession. We have legal possession. Even if we won our land claim, so to speak, for the South Shore of Montreal. By the way, the Canadian government uh, agrees that we're right, but just won't give it back. <laughs> so we just need to let people know that. Uh, it's too, too expensive and it would upset too many people. So therefore, justice has to take a back seat again. You know, so even if we got that back, though, if they said, okay, you're right, you know, here's your, here's your 52,000 acres back, uh, the heck with the 100,000 French people who live on that land, you know, let's move them away. If they did say that, the character of that land is basically one that reflects, you know, the capitalistic values of the, of the society which has been using it and occupied for so long. There's no more medicines uh, growing there, or hardly any. There's no more use that we can have of it to promote our culture. So development is a different one. The last one I want to talk about today, there's other ways too, but I mean the last one that I focus on because it's the work that I've done is uh, contamination. And this comes mainly out of the work that I did that opened my eyes uh, seriously to this whole framework of the problem that I'm talking about now in Akuzasne uh, in Cornwall, not far from here. Uh, Akuzasne, Cornwall. Uh, I say Cornwall because there's industrial plants there and in Messina, New York that affect al in the Mohawk community. And so before this, I kind of understood things in the way that I've been talking about it thus up to this point. Get land back, make use of it, um, solve the problem of colonization by repossessing, and not really understanding the, the character question of the land and, and the character of the relationship to the land. Not having grown up in a, in a really close relationship to the natural environment myself because of the development and the dispossession. But in doing work, which I was asked to do in Akwazasne, in the Mohawks of Akwazasne, over the last eight years, oriented <coughs> to documenting and helping them understand uh, the effects of environmental contamination in the natural environment on their cultural practices, and then writ large on the nature of the community and the relationship <coughs> to that community, have really opened my eyes to the seriousness of the problem and how desperate, really, the situation is for the survival in the long term of indigeneity. Because if we're, if we're faced with a problem, a fundamental problem where it's not only dispossession, which by the way is ongoing, it's not only development, which is increasing, but also environmental contamination affecting the medicines and the animals and the water and so forth, preventing you from actually using the land and the water and relating to the animals and the plants in the way you need to, to be indigenous. That's a very serious thing. And it's a very scary thing too. Uh, Aaron worked uh, on this with me too. Uh, I go for a graduate, Aaron, sitting here, working at AFN now. Uh, and uh, I think she can ba verify the fact that it's a daunting task to actually have to think through it. You know, it's kind of depressing, actually, when you get to it, you know. At least I felt depressed uh, two or three years into the process. I don't get depressed easy. You might get the sense of kind of an optimistic person. I try to have a good, strong mind all the time and look forward to things. Um, but faced with a mountain of evidence in a room about this big, full uh, file cabinets and DVDs full of uh, health studies, environmental toxicology reports, uh, sociological studies, all kinds of things, file cabinets full of information about how uh, the natural environment around Akuzasne was so contaminated with PCBs and dioxins and all kinds of things that it was basically unusable from a human standpoint for self-sustenance. For self um, and there's really a long, long uh, time frame for fixing that problem, if ever. And beyond that, there's the political problem of somebody has to pay for it. And that's not an easy one to resolve, even in the short term. <coughs> so you can see, I can see in some of your faces, you're depressed just hearing me say this. <laughs> uh, believe me, I'm not going to leave you at that place. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take you beyond that to hopefully a place where you can see a solution and see something worth fighting for and worth. Uh, learning about as you go along in your journey here educationally and politically. But those three, those three ways are the ones that I've under, come to understand are the actual manifestations of colonization. All the rest of it are, are structures to get to those things, you know. So the Indian Act and uh, Aboriginal title, yes I'm saying it in a negative way, Aboriginal title and all that are mechanisms to allow dispossession. Are, are the means to the contamination. 
are the ways of degrading the land and our relationship with it. So those things are a structure on top of the root of the problem. And I got to my understanding by really experiencing it and listening to the, to the stories of people who experienced it firsthand. People who had remained on the land or were born on it and who suffered through it and had come through the other side and really had the opportunity through the work I did to reflect on. Okay, so, um, and in personal conversations too and trying to organize in communities for people to stand up uh, for their land and the rights that they have on it. So I'll tell three little, three little stories, three little anecdotes really about three people um, who uh, affected my understanding. So I'll start in Ganawagi. Uh, in Ganawagi, because that's where I'm from. And I love Ganawagi. Anybody on Twitter has a pictures of the river and stuff like that. And uh, the reason I'm so focused on that river and our relationship to it is because I grew up, well, I was born in 1964, which was shortly after the St. Lawrence Seaway was built. Uh, short Canadian history lesson. Uh, Canadians and Americans <coughs> uh, decided to build the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is a huge canal which runs from the Great Lakes all the way to Montreal, basically, and allows uh, ocean-going vessels to get to the Great Lakes. Great pressure from the Americans after the war to do this, to develop their the Great Lakes region economically. And uh, the Liberal Party of Canada uh, agreed to do it and promoted it, and Paul Martin must have a real guilty conscience because his dad was one of the main beneficiaries of Canada's steamship lines <laughs> in developing the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, which may explain some of his uh, attitudes <laughs> towards uh, native people yeah. and the harm that's been done to them and how we to, you know, uh, rectify that situation. Anyway, shorter Canadian history lesson boils down to it. They took the historic homeland of Ganawagi, uh, where people resided, where the farms were, where all of the, where, where the, where the core of the community was, and they expropriated that by order of council. Uh, people resisted, RCMP were used, people were moved, there was some violence, but in the end, uh, the act passed, the order council passed, people were removed, compensation and minimal forms was given, and this huge seaway was built. I know there's other communities affected, we're going to talk about Gunnawagi now and how it affects a community, uh, this, this sort of uh, development. My father's house, if you go to Gunnawagi and you, and you go to the church, which is still there, uh, you can see the seaway passes right through it. So my father's family house was right in the middle of the seaway. Where it would have, it would have been, is right <coughs> in the middle of the seaway. So you can imagine, I was growing up, you know, with a great deal of uh, multi-generational kind of hostility, uh, multi-generational anger and uh, resentment at the whole fact of the seaway, but a lot of uh, sadness as well to what was lost. And so my first kind of thinking on this came through that and recognizing that Ganawagi today and the Ganawagi that I grew up in was not a real Ganawagi. You know, you think about it that way as a young kid growing up. If you grow up and you're, you're a Mohawk, what's the extension of that? Well, you're not a real Mohawk, right? You know, that, they don't say that and of course they love you too much. It's not really the, the kind of point that they're wanting to make. But that's what you're hearing. You know, if, if it was all about fishing for sturgeon and eels and huge uh, areas where there were strawberry bushes so thick that there were tunnels you could walk through it and get bushels of bushels and all kinds of medicines and people loved it and they used to float down the river all the time. It's so beautiful, you know. And then what do you got? <laughs> you got like a slag heap and uh, a bunch of rocks with no grass on it. That's, uh, that's all the rocks that they blasted out from the seaway and dumped all over Ganawabe. And that's where you play, throwing rocks at rats and stuff like that. You know, that's, that, that's, the kind of, uh, that's the kind of environment, not exaggerating too much, uh, that we grew up in. And so by extension, yes, the thing is, well, what, what is it to be Mohawk? It's that. And what is it to be Mohawk for? What, what am I living right now? And so to hear my dad as the generation that made the transition, and to see the kind of cultural confusion and the, uh, the effects of uh, sadness, alienation, and the effects of alcohol, uh, increased alcoholism and family problems and so forth, all of those sorts of things uh, exacerbated, uh, I'd say that's a minimal kind of effect. They were causing a lot of families by this because you not only had this kind of psychological effect of the seaway, but you had the physical dispersion of the, of the community 
history as well. So in this little microcosm of experience, you had the whole history of colonization, really. You had people coming in, violence, you had a separation of families, one previously all living together, great grandma, grandma, all the kids all centered around here in these family units and farms. After the Seaway boom, single family housing and different streets and, and people having to go into, into other places to live and work and so forth. Terrible in hindsight. People didn't understand that when I grew up though. So my dad understood the effects, but he didn't he wasn't able to process it. In Ganawagi today, people are just starting to process it. We did a video about three or four years ago, Mohawk Council Ganawagi did. It's online, I think if you go to their website. And it's it's kind of reflections on the St. Lawrence Seaway, the history of the Seaway. And uh, I was really happy and proud to be part of that because of my personal relationship. But you're beginning to see people understanding, okay, now now I see the seaway is just not this big ugly thing that we have to deal with. It really had a profound effect on who we are as people. So that's development in the story of my father. My father uh, was born in Hawaii, uh, grew up in New York a bit because they were ironworking and stuff, came back, but went through this whole, this whole process here of losing his family's place and then having to kind of find a place in the world. And uh, not an easy transition for any of them of that generation. Um, the next person that really affected my understanding in a really deep way, because um, I kind of grew up in this environment, as I said. I hadn't really had any first-hand knowledge like many people here, although I'm sure some do, of that the old form of colonial aggressive dispossession where people come in and under a force of arms take people out of their homeland and, and repopulate it with other people. With other people. That's, that's happened not too, in the not too uh, far past in Canada, and I know that because previous to knowing uh, my wife and her family, it was something I read about and I kind of understood, you know, being a professor and so forth, but hadn't really uh, understood in a deep kind of personal way. And then thinking about the story of my mother-in-law, who's passed away now, uh, it really affected me deeply in terms of what the land means to someone. This is a person who didn't just grow up like on the river in a fairly modernized environment like my dad, so I'm kind of taking it deeper and deeper. This is a person who grew up wearing moss for diapers. Okay? That's, uh, that's as native as you can get in terms of your, your, uh, your lifestyle. Living in a cabin um, on a little bend on a creek way up northern BC behind the sides of Bay Mountain. Uh, Donald Lake, if you've been up there. Um, you know, dad fighting off grizzly bears and living off salmon, and as traditional as you get. Her mom was like the first people to see, not my wife's mom, her mom, was the first one to see white people mm -hmm. coming into their territory. And that's something to consider that in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, people were living in that situation where they still had that kind of cultural, um, physical continuity of connection to their land, the cultural cohesiveness, the sense of themselves, the language, and so forth. And the story of uh, Annette Joseph, uh, in, in, my, in my understanding, is just so tragic because it's exemplary of, of colonization in its most brutal form as it's still going on today, where not only the residential school and the, the TV hospital and so forth, but the physical removal of her territory, um, the physical removal of her family from the territory, and the effects of that resounding through the generations are just incredible. And you can't really understand colonization until you understand how it breaks a person's heart to be removed from their land and their culture. And to ask them to just accommodate or to, to get along or to get a job or to get an education, it's, it's not possible. And that's what my understanding was in looking uh, at the experience in the land. There were 19, 19 uh, no, 11 kids. 11 kids, they all died of violence. Every single one of them died of violence. Husbands, shooting, wives, um, all victims, uh, all victims of violence. Uh, tragic car accidents, by accident by drowning and so forth. Uh, a few of them by, by murder and so forth. And you can imagine the effects then on the kids and that second generation of which my wife is. Um, just incredible. And my passion for this issue really became inflamed when I came to understand that story. You go up there and you look at the territory and you drive through northern BC and you come across 
come across from Prince George, which isn't so nice. But you drive across, <laughs> you, you come through Prince George, you come through Burns Lake, and then you come up and tell and you're like, this is paradise. This is this is in the movies, you know. You've got the mountains, the snow-capped peaks, the rolling hills. Beautiful, beautiful territory. And then you realize the violent history that went into creating that landscape and goes into maintaining that social landscape on that physical landscape. And then you can't help but become enraged. And so the dispossession is still ongoing too. And that's something that didn't happen too far in the past. And it's certainly resonating in the lives of people today. Uh, younger, young people, not just older people, young people, uh, a generation or two were born from that. The last person, well not the last person, but the, the last little anecdote I'll share with you is somebody that maybe some people here know, Tom Porter. Tom Porter, Mohawk elder uh, from Wampus Asne. Um, he's taught a lot of us a lot of things. He's a, you know, one of the greatest teachers for more people and for other people uh, in this country. But the uh, thing that he taught me, uh, I'd say most, the thing that he taught me most was again related to the effects of uh, this kind of process of the colonial manifestation on the land. Because you know, he's obviously a person that loved, loved his territory, loved his land. Uh, he was a he was a cultural practitioner, so unlike my mother-in-law who was removed by force, unlike my dad who couldn't do it, uh, Tom Porter and Abu Sassan, up until the 1970s and 80s, they they did continue the cultural practices. You know, it was a modernized community to a certain extent, but uh, you know it was still based in large part uh, on traditional practices with medicines and with uh, crafting, with fishing, and so forth. He was a big fisher, fisher person, for kids that I was teaching. And so he was committed, like, like many people are, um, to feeding his kids traditional foods. Like if you're Mohawk, you fish and you eat the, the perch and you eat the surgeons and you eat those fish and you maintain the culture through the language and through the words for it and the practices, you share practices, you transfer knowledge and you transfer identity in that way and you create love for your land and for your people in those practices. So when we did our work in Abu Zasne about the effects of contamination, he was one of the people that we wanted to talk to, of course. And uh, so we went talk to him. And uh, at some point, I'll be able to release this study. Unfortunately, it's in a legal process, so I can't publish it yet. The video is up there, I don't think it But at some point, it will be. And it's another heartbreaking video. Because here you have this very strong person, this uh, carrier of the culture, sitting there talking about the day that he realized that the the waters were contaminated. So he was in, uh, in the 80s, he was talking about how he uh, got up in the morning and he heard on the radio there was a warning. It was the day they issued the, the notice. Don't eat the fish. They're contaminated with PCBs. Do not eat the fish. The results are conclusive. And no more can you, can you uh, recommend you know, uh, feeding your kids or the wife uh, those kind of fish because of the PCBs. In them. He says he heard that, and he, he thought about, and immediately flashed into his mind all those times he had given his kids fish. Because this wasn't just something that happened today, right? This was just something that we had studied and concluded that was a problem in 1981 that had been happening for so many years. And so for so many years, he's been feeding his kids this and telling them to go into the water and use it and all this stuff. And he says his heart just dropped. He heard that, and he, he went down to the river, and he ripped up his nets, he ripped them up, and he threw them down, and he just said, that's it, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. And for us sitting there looking at him saying, that, that's like an instant, that's an instant of the death of, the, of a culture right there. That is how it happens. We talk about, the, we theorize the colonization and the death of a culture, that's it. It's somebody realizing that they're harming their kids by practicing their traditional culture and saying, I'm never doing that again. Thankfully, Tom Porter changed his mind. And he founded another community on the Mohawk River in our ancestral uh, homeland, Kana Joharege. And uh, he's, he's uh, continuing on with the work he does. But at that time, think about how many people on the festival were affected by that. I talked to another person, Sazid Mitchell, who's another uh, super valuable resource for the Mohawk people in terms of her, her healing powers and her knowledge of plants a preeminent uh, person with medicines in our possessment. And she said the same thing. She says at some point, you know, people come to her for help. She gives them medicine, she gives them a plan, she tells them what to do and all that. And then she realized she was poisoning people, that's the way she put it. 
I said, I, I realized that I was poisoning people by giving them medicines. That that's how perverted things have become. That's how upside down things have become. And then she decided to stop that. So think about the 80s in Nakuzaste <coughs> and Ganawage. Not a good time uh, spiritually, uh, psychologically, and, uh, and otherwise for people who are committed to remaining indigenous in the way that our ancestors understood it. And those are the things that, for me, uh, have brought home the point of what colonization really is. So when I think about doing something about it, it's on those bases. It's, it's kind of boiling it down to that. All of those mechanisms, the legal and the economic and other things, are secondary to how do I get someone like Tom Porter to want to go fishing again? Or how do, I, how do we work together to get Suzy Mitchell to want to, you know, teach young girls about medicines and get them practicing again? How do I get my dad to feel proud about being in Ganawagi and to actually reconnect to the river? How do I get him to jump in the river again like the way he used to? Those kind of questions. So it boils down to that. Um, and so anything that adds to that, anything that kind of advances that understanding of what it is to be indigenous, to me, in my mind, is decolonizing. That's, that's what decolonizing is. Because the colonization is the perversion of our practices to, to, to either serve the colonial enterprise or to harm ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the result of all of this, and you know, the title, and part of the title of the talk is the psychophysical <laughs> effects. The results of this are both psychological and physical. Right? Psychologically, I've been alluding to them all along, you know, it's kind of alienation, but there's, there's really documented studies um, that have been done by some really good scientists. Uh, Lawrence Kermeyer is uh, me and Aaron's favorite uh, social uh, uh, scientist right now. Uh, because Lawrence Kermeyer and the late Gil Valskakis, who some of us knew, uh, did a fantastic set of um, studies uh, and edited a fantastic volume on the psychological uh, mental health effects of colonization and the mental health status of indigenous people. And the psychological effects are, are, are kind of understood at this point in terms of the, the lack of ability to, I'll just kind of give a short summary, the lack of ability to trust, uh, uh, loathing, of the society at large, self-hatred, uh, alienation, not feeling connected, not feeling whole, inability to really relate to other people in a way that's healthy and create a <coughs> healthy, uh, positive relationship. These go across the board for colonization all over the world, but here we're facing it in uh, Canada, and the point is to be made because of ongoing uh, harms that are being done. It's not a historical problem, this psychological malaise, this kind of colonized mentality that we have. It's not a historical carryover, although I think I've shown it is. There are elements of multi-generational trauma, and there's historical unresolved trauma is another way that it's been understood. Um, there's all kinds of harms that are carried forward. But there's also the ongoing effort, which are normal, natural responses, responses of people who suffer these sort of injustices. So, you know, the whole problematizing of natives in Canada as psychologically unstable or not being able to deal with modern society uh, and so forth, the judgments that people make on, in the street but also scientifically and in, in therapeutic circles are really misguided because these are natural responses. If someone came to anyone's house and burned it down and took away their kids and did all these things and dug up the ground and told them they could never speak their language, have to do this and that and, that, and then force that on them and force their kids to do the same thing, pretty sure they'd react the same way. <laughs> they are reacting to colonization. Right? So what is the problem? Is the Indian problem, in quotes, the Indian? Or is the Indian problem the people who take the Indian land and make the Indian respond in a normal, natural, human way? So obviously I'm giving away my answer. <laughs> psychological element is well understood now, although we've yet to really develop a program of action that works in order to get at it. The physical side of it, we're just getting to it. We're just starting to come to an understanding. So the psychophysical effects is the, is the word that I like to use because we don't really separate the two in any real understanding of, uh, of human health. Psychology and the physical body are obviously tied. In a traditional native way of thinking, of course, it goes beyond that. You, know, you have all kinds of things that need to relate to each other. But even thinking about it in terms of 
just the physical body and the, and the, and the mind and inside, inside the person, what's going on in there. You look at what happens when you either suffer a dispossession, development, or contamination. Uh, there's two really profound effects. One is food, what's, what's today called food insecurity. You know, that's the kind of, people are studying that and so forth. What that means basically is that you can't eat your traditional food, you have to eat it from the that you only, that you can afford, and that are put in front of you. Okay, so in Ganawange, they can't eat eels anymore, they can't eat sturgeon, they can't eat perch, uh, they can't hunt, they can't, they can't grow corn, they can't eat strawberries and all that stuff. They have to go to IGA or Maxis and buy whatever's there, whatever. In Ganawange, it's not such a problem because they got lots of money these days. Um, but in a lot of native communities, you know, this dispossession here <coughs> leads to food insecurity in the sense that they are not getting quality food that should be sustaining anyone because they can't afford it and the options are just not there. Besides the point of spiritually and culturally in these cultures and in these societies, it's necessary to, to relate to the animals and the plants in a way where you consume them in a certain way according to certain cultural practices and rituals. So not only is it kind of a, a hit on the nutritional uh, front, which is understood scientifically, but it's a hit spiritually too. If you can't show respect to the plants and if you can't be in a good relationship with the fish and the animals, what we found in uh, Abu Zastan's study was that if you're in a mentality of a Mohan, you're not really living a Mohan life. You're judging yourself again. Feedback loop into the psychology, you know, into the psychology of bringing you down. You're not living a true life, you're not living a true Mohawk life because you're not doing what a Mohawk should do, which your traditions tell you to do. So there's the nutritional side of it, and then there's the spiritual side of it too. The other aspect of it, the whole other aspect on the issue of uh, the physicality is in relation to mainly at this point diabetes in our communities. Okay. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes, people have studied it. Uh, it's a relationship, I think, that comes out of these food choices, but also the, the sedentary lifestyle that we forced it to because of a lack of access to our territory. So our, our territories have been uh, either alienated, those three things. We can't use them in a way that is healthy in the sense that we can't work them anymore. It takes a lot of work to put out fish boxes, to go fishing, to do all that kind of stuff, to, to cut it, both the males and the female part of the culture. Uh, it takes a lot of work to chop down uh, uh, trees or cut up trees in order to get splints for black ash baskets. It takes a lot of work to live traditional. But that's a healthy, good thing. It takes a lot of work. There's a physicality to it. There's ability and responsibility to move around, to do the kind of things that you need to do to keep a human body healthy and fit. And Native people, on the whole, when they have dispossession or the development or the contamination, are prevented from doing that. And so Native people, if you look at all the studies, uh, are, ex are extremely highly affected by the dynamic of this uh, lack of uh, Trina Delormier, a, a Ganawage uh, scientist, uh, food science person, who's done a study on this just uh, last year, calls it the foodscape and the fitscape of that. She's a young academic, so she has to think of all these terms, these buzzwords, you know, okay? and they're great, they work. Uh, fitscape, I wouldn't think of that myself, but uh, when you think about it, it really works. Like what's, there's the landscape and there's the ability to use it to do the kind of things that keep you fit. The foodscape, well, in Ganawagi, the foodscape is pretty, pretty barren, pretty bleak. And so you, you put these, up, these things all together, and what do you got? You've got colonization in a very real way. Right? There are people who have come to realize this, and there are people who have tried to address the problem. Okay, so I've kind of talked about what the problem is. Now I want to talk about the solution that is to try it. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because, unfortunately, none, none has worked. <laughs> <laughs> And this is by the admission of people who have studied it. People who I respect and admire who I'm working with right now, in spite of the fact that it hasn't worked, to continue to try to do something. Okay, and I'll use the example of um, the Kanawagi School Diabetes Prevention Project, okay? KSDGP. So that was a landmark project in Kanawagi to address the kind of things that I'm talking about. So it was, uh, we started with a collaboration of McGill uh, scientists, medical people, community leaders, teachers in the community, and was 
sort of all throughout the community with kids, teaching about healthy lifestyles, teaching about nutrition, promoting it in an active way, organizing events, kind of a whole community effort to try to get at the root of the problem of what was causing diabetes in that community to become such a big, such a big issue and to hurt people so much. And the Kahnawake School <coughs> Diabetes Prevention Project, people still go around, my friend Alex McCumber and the people were involved in all over the world really talking about it because it was a successful effort to address it. But the people that were also involved in Trina Delormia writes about this as well in her paper, uh, are coming to realize that it wasn't a success if the determinant of success was reducing the level of type 2 diabetes and uh, obesity on the status of kids in Gondwani. It was successful in a lot of different ways. It did change people's perception of <coughs> exercise. It did change people's perception of food. But people are still getting diabetes. And so why? That was a big question. And um, we don't know why, but we can sense why. Because we're coming to realize, as uh, Charlotte Lopi Redding realized in another study she did, in, and Jeff, Jeff Redding and Charlotte Lopi, um, partners working on, a, on this question as well in terms of the determinants of average health, that there are proximate, scientific language, there are proximate causes, there are intermediate causes, and there's distal causes in scientific language. What that means is we're only getting at the surface. You know, we're getting at the surface of the problem. And the conclusion that they came to was that all of the efforts that have been put forward so far, whether it's Ganawagi School Diabetes Prevention Project, and by the way, there was another one in Sandy Bay, I understand too, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, that we tried and had similar success and failure in terms of not really affecting the problem. Um, what they've come to realize, and more and more academic studies are getting at this, is that we're very good at treating the symptoms of the problem, but we're not really good at understanding what the root cause of it, and we're certainly not having any political effort, and we're not having any kind of organization behind getting at the root cause of the problem, which is increasingly becoming so clear, even from a scientific perspective. Because, as Chandler and Lalone said in their study in 2001, I believe it was, a landmark study referred to by everyone who works in this field, which linked um, suicide rates and the reduction of suicide rates in Native communities to the level of autonomy and self-government. That control over your life, control over your community, uh, possession of your culture, continuation of your culture, and the ability to transfer that, and see the results of that in the lives of your children is really important to alleviating the reasons why people do the kind of things that give them diabetes and, and all these other things. And what's the ability that people need to have? The ability that people need to have is to relate to their land. And so Chandler and Malone in this landmark study point to self-government. It's, it's a tentative conclusion though. I know Chris Malone is a nice guy. Uh, he's not political at all though. And I think was probably conscious of the fact of what he was saying. You know, it, was, it was a revolutionary basically. He says, Native kids have a higher suicide, there's a higher rate of suicide in Native communities because of the fact that we have colonized them and they don't have control over their own communities. If you want to address any of the problems, and I think by extension, all the health problems as well, not only the, the suicide problem, if you want to affect those problems, you have to give them self-government. You have to respect the right of their nation and you have to allow them to control their own communities and their lives and govern themselves. I don't think you went far enough though. Because what's self-government without land? <laughs> Nothing. And we're finding that out too. Look at the Yukon uh, two or three days ago in the news. Uh, the Yukon, one of the first people to sign a self-government agreement. Right? Surrender, one of those surrender agreements early on, which uh, gave the province and the uh, federal government basically control over the land. Uh, gave them self-government, but as a beneficiary sort of of the uh, economic activity that goes on there. They're not playing ball now and the government's cutting them off. Like, what does self-government mean? They're not playing ball with development. They don't have self-government. If they had their own land and were self-sufficient on the land, either in an economic activity kind of way or in a traditional sustenance way, they would have protection from that, that political problem. And so when it, when it comes down to it, really, the problem that's causing all these psycho, psychophysical effects in Native communities is our disconnection from the land. When I first worked here in uh, 92, uh, Rosa Leticia 
was an el elder working at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And we were still in the mindset that I've been describing here about self-government and economics and all that. And she used to bring us to her house, all the younger Native scholars, great person, Rosalie, um, along with uh, her friend Boyce Richardson, and they would tell us all, you know, show us films and feed us and tell us about traditional foods and report. And I remember her saying, I was telling her a lot of she used to say, it's all about the land. And, we, and that kind of went to us uh, at that point, you know, sure, it's all about the land, sounds good. I don't know what that means, really. You know, I don't, my land is, <laughs> I've got to walk in here, a big pile of rocks. And, uh, you know, I looked around and I see, I see the land, but I'm not really connected to it. She used to say that, it's all about the land. And I, it's funny, but 20 years later, <laughs> it's all coming around full circle. I was like, yeah, she was right. <laughs> look at all this research and look at my own uh, intellectual journey here. <laughs> and yeah, Rosalie, I don't know if you're here, but if you're around in Ottawa or whatever, right on. It is all about the land, and I think that that's what it comes down to. The problem is, of course, is that the realization doesn't make it a reality. I can hopefully convince uh, some of you here today focus on this in your thinking and to illustrate the work that I do with it increasingly more and more people are doing to reconnect <coughs> back to the land and to try to restore presence on the land. But it is, it is extremely difficult to do that on technology and uh, really encouraging people to think about this when they do think about their research projects and their, their political commitments too. It's probably the most radical thing you can do. The most radical thing you can do is to say that I'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to fight to have my kids write to take medicines and animals and live and drink the water uh, in a traditional territory of her people. His people. Um, wow, you know, that, that's scary for people rather than saying, you know, um, as our friends at the AFN are doing, uh, let's figure out a way to uh, monetize this situation. Uh, the problem is really too far gone. And that's the conventional solution, basically. The conventional solution in the discourse in Canada is to acknowledge that it's too far gone. People like me, um, I've heard this said, and I'm sure people who are involved in politics at this level have heard this said too, you're all romantic, you're dreamers. You know, you're a dreamer. Do you ever think that, that we're going to get back to that situation? The reality is what we see here today. Or the reality is if you're up in north and in Smithers or something, and so in or the reality is logging, mining, um, pipeline, all those sorts of things. That's the reality. Get with, get with the 21st century. You know? But I think that that really is a, a lashing out against, I won't talk about what <coughs> people say, it. it's a lashing out against the fundamental truth that they understand but are unable to accept because of the implications of it. The implications of the changes that people need to make and the, the seriousness of the changes people need to make in their own lives to reorient away from this colonial structure that we become a part of. It's very difficult tear oneself away from that. And there's very few people that have worked to do that. Um, and the cost is very high. So two stories to illustrate this. Since I'm talking about the, the pipeline, since we're supposed to be debating oil. <laughs> uh, the first instance, uh, the gateway pipeline, the gateway pipeline uh, is proposed and it runs right through the Soil Nations territory. My wife is with Soil kids are in Toronto and but so then so I have uh, as I explained to uh, my host Arcee here, uh, I have no objectivity on this at all. So I'm not a <laughs> scientist on this question. I'm thinking about how to keep my kids in a position where they have the ability to use the land as we try to do as much as possible to, to reconnect them to their sense of being with so many people. And, and of course there's with so many people that are fully dedicated to that as well. Um, this is the front of the decolonizing struggle right there. That's like the point again. Not the kind of negotiations over land, not Aboriginal rights uh, in theory, in court and all that. It's people getting out there, as they're doing today, uh, in the way of the pipeline. I'm not giving anything away because it's all right. uh, building, building cabins in the way of the pipeline, taking out uh, stakes and really being on the ground, fighting against it, organizing rallies and fighting against the, an effort to really undermine the only thing that works to alleviate the suffering of indigenous people and to raise the health and uh, living standards of native people, which is this return to the land and to giving them some sense of connection and renewing the, the psychological illness of that native person. People are using that land, they don't live out there permanently. 
So what so they use it for hunting, they use it for medicines, they, they really relate to that land and the, and the sacredness of it in a serious way and it's maintained and it's like a lifeline. In spite of all these other things happening in their life, and there's terrible things happening in Morris Town and all over the place as we well know, but it's a lifeline culturally that keeps it there. And that cut that, that pipeline wants to come and cut it off. The last thing they got after having been removed, dispossessed, and all that stuff, the last thing they got is the sacred connection to those places and they want to come and ignore that move right through that too and prevent them from being doing that. So there's a front of resistance there that I think is really the front that people should be supporting and looking at. That front is the one that is the most important thing in Canada. Now if you care about indigenous people's survival, because all of these other solutions are colonial. They're really colonial solutions and they lead to a colonial a colonial conclusion. You're accommodating somehow colonization, you're accommodating yourself and you are hopefully developing um, the ability to get good enough job to pay for the medications it takes to actually <laughs> to live with yourself after that. You know, because that's what it comes down to. How many people in the larger society are you really talking about, whether you're native or not? I know that two thirds of the antidepressants in the world are sold in North America. There's a reason for that. By the way, my wife's a physician, so I know all about white people's problems too. <laughs> He doesn't tell me details, but you know, I'm part of those circles. And I hear and I read and all these same things. And I know things not going my fault and glory in the larger society as well. So this is for you too, white people. It's not only native that need to reconnect to nature. It's for everybody. And we're the ones trying to show the way, and we're the ones trying to protect the ability to do that in conjunction with some friends and helpers and allies the environmental movement care about communities and nature as well. But a human being exists in nature, how could you ignore that? How could you, you know, you can't. And certainly as an indigenous person, you can't ignore the most fundamental teaching about what it is to be indigenous no matter what nation you're from. That, that being, you have to be in a respectful, harmonious relationship with the natural environment, carry out your responsibilities to the other aspects of the creation. If you can't do that, you're suffering. You're suffering spiritually, you're suffering culturally, you're suffering physically as hopefully I've shown here today. The Enbridge, anti-Enbridge thing is a, is, a, is a kind of a resistance thing. And I'll finish off just by talking about the kind of more positive, um, proactive um, work that's being done too in an environment that is not so contentious where people are actually trying to help and foster. Okay, so granted the people that are helping and fostering has had to be goaded into it and had to be sued. It had to be sued by big powerful entities like the United States government, the state of New York, and the uh, Mohawk, uh, St. Rich Mohawk tribe, I'm talking about uh, Alcoa and General Motors. Uh, I talked about Agbazasne. The United States, unlike Canada, has at least a law where major polluters can be brought to uh, some sort of environmental justice. The like Superfund law came in in uh, You can go through an extensive process and you can sue a company that's responsible for destroying the natural environment through contamination. And so Mohawks and Bagus went through that process successful. Successful in the sense that they got redress. Uh, so the natural environment, some remediation was done in terms of taking out those PCBs, uh, not to the satisfaction of anyone, but you know, as much as the law forced General Motors to do it, you know, quote, it was done to the point now where there is the ability of the Mohawk people in that area to begin to relate to the land again. Okay. And so the work that I did was really to look at going beyond documenting the harm as I've been talking about here. Now coming to the conclusion about these harms here, how do we fix it? What do we do? Is it a sob story? Or do we just say, too bad, you know, we're victims of contamination. This is cultural injury and we deserve a compensation. Most tribes who get involved in the United States in this process go for compensation. I think simply because they can't really conceptualize a way to restore the cultural practice which defines them. And it's sad to say, but compensation is the biggest compensation uh, for some sort of compensatory uh, action. Sort of like if you can't fish in a river anymore because it's so contaminated, well, we'll pay for you to build big giant fish farms with white perch. Uh, or if you can't swim in it anymore, we'll pay for swimming pools. You can teach kids how to swim. <coughs> I mean, that's not totally wrong, but is it really getting at what I'm talking about here, especially if you look at it from an indigenous perspective in terms of the relationship to, those, to that natural environment? No. So the 
walks out of the dust and you're proud to say the work that we did, we're the first ones to really conceptualize how do we restore the practice on the land of those people? And what do we need to do? And so through a massive legal process, and I won't, I'll spare you the details unless you're in law school or want to get into the politics here, we can talk about that. Uh, a couple of years of wrangling, and finally, and even going through the general owner's bankruptcy, uh, when they were let off from all their legal obligations by the law <coughs> administration, um, still came through with some support financially for a program of action in this regard by the monks of Augusta. And in short, what that is, is taking all what I just said seriously and say, how do we get young people in Akuzasne to once again understand themselves as Mohawk in the way that their ancestors did in the context of that natural environment, using it, eating the foods, using the medicines, and so forth. And the best that we could come up with, and here's where I say I don't really have any answers, we're working on this, because we haven't really implemented it yet. we conceptualized it. We're in the process of putting it into practice, but we haven't re yet determined if it's another one of those kind of things that works half-heartedly and doesn't really get at the root of the problem. But I think it gets at the problem in a deeper way than previous solutions and kind of therapeutic solutions because it gets at the crux of it and it, makes, and it puts Native people on the land again and it gets them using it. So what we have is this kind of cultural, uh, traditional, traditional use mentorship program and apprenticeship program where we have people who are still, people like Tom Porter who come back to it, uh, people like Suzanne Mitchell who, who again are doing the medicines, a whole bunch of other people are investing. We pair them up with younger people who want to learn. And then we also put in the language component. We have people who are expert teachers, like Martin Peters, you know, Augustine, and have them work with these people, this group of people, to really, through, the, through a constant process of related to the land, and looking at the land and using it, and learning specific techniques and practices and traditional uses, learn about themselves, learn about the history, learn about the culture, reattach to the land and learn the language at the same time and then share that knowledge with the community to a very, in a very structured way and hopefully come to the point where you'll have not only 15 people, which is probably about the number of masters that we have right now, but that you have maybe 30 or 60 in a generation or two of people that once again have a connection to the land that we can then pass on to the next generation. Then I think we'll really have gotten that problem of uh, how do you deal with historical injustice and colonization in a way that makes a real difference in the lives of indigenous people. It's not just something facilitating uh, the furtherance of the original colonial injustice. It is not placating, it is not kind of putting a bandage on the situation, but it's making people understand themselves and see the world as more. In that context, I think that there's hope. So I promise I wouldn't leave you. Totally depressing. So we're recruiting. If you're from up with us, then, you know, come see me after. We're recruiting people for it. Even if you're not from up with us, then, you're Mohawk, um, Kwanawagi, or Gunsadagi, or something like that, uh, come and see me, and uh, we'll talk about that. But I think I'm going to leave you there. Uh, and hopefully have shed some light on an aspect of colonization that is not often talked about, but that, in my mind, probably the most crucial problem we're facing.